Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, apologize for the slight delay. I was just uh, uh, rereading for the pure enjoyment the article you know, above the fold in the New York Times today about uh, projected decline in health care premiums. <laughs> Highly recommended. Before I take your questions, on Thursday, the President will deliver remarks to discuss how the Affordable Care Act is holding insurance companies accountable and putting money back into the pockets of over 8.5 million Americans. We hear a lot about what the law might do or could do, but tomorrow the President will detail one concrete way that Americans who have health insurance today are affected by the law. This summer, 8.5 million consumers are receiving half a billion dollars in rebates. The average consumer rebate is around $100. This is just one of the many ways the Affordable Care Act is giving consumers a better value for their health care dollar and making our health care system stronger. As I mentioned earlier, you may have seen this morning that New York State announced the health insurance plan rates for insurers seeking to offer coverage through New York's health insurance marketplace. Not only will new insurers be entering the market to offer plans to consumers, the cost for even the most comprehensive plans will be down by over 50 percent, according to the state. This is despite the fact that New York's health care costs are much higher than the national average. But this is in line with what we've seen in other states, like California and Oregon. Competition and transparency in the marketplaces, plus the hard effort uh, by those committed to making the law work, are leading to affordable, new, and better choices for families. I noticed in that article that, for example, an individual whose premium this year is $1,000 might see his or her premium drop in New York next year to $308. There is a particular poignancy to this story today because for the 38th, 39th, 40th time, I, I've lost count, I think they have too, the House of Representatives will be voting to repeal the Affordable Care Act today. Uh, in other words, they'll be voting through their measure to uh, delay implementation of the individual mandate to keep those rates at $1,000 for the individual in New York rather than $308 to ensure that everyone out there who worries about whether they have or a family member has a pre-existing condition and whether or not they'll be, get health insurance coverage uh, will continue to worry. That worry doesn't exist now because of the Affordable Care Act, but if Republicans in the House had their way, uh, Americans could worry again about uh, that prospect. So they go about the business again of trying to overturn a law that is providing enormous benefits and, as we've seen again, will provide even more benefits to the American people. Uh, we're going about the business of implementing a law that provides those be benefits. And with that, I will take your questions. Next. Thanks, Jay. Um, on the Senate deal on nominees, is the President 100 percent happy with this? It, I mean, there's still the prospect that future nominees could get held up. He's still having a problem getting through some of his judicial nominees. Does he wish there would have been more um, to prevent those kind of holdups in the future? The President believes that Senator Reid uh, did an excellent job in uh, the manner in which he approached this problem and the manner in which he worked with uh, his colleagues to resolve it. Right, let's look at the end result. The, all of the President's nominees will be confirmed according to the agreement. Uh, that includes, as the President mentioned today, Richard Cordray as head of the CFPB. Now, if I had stood before you two weeks ago and said, I predict that Rich Cordray will get confirmed by a 66 vote margin, you would have laughed me out of the room. You probably would have said that if I had predicted that the President would have nominees to the NLRB board confirmed. Uh, and perhaps if I had said that about uh, his EPA and Labor Department nominees. Uh, this is a uh, good development and it achieves what the President has long sought, which is that his qualified nominees be considered and confirmed uh, efficiently by the Senate. And, uh, the President is very pleased, as you heard him say today, by uh, the result of the hard work and the approach uh, that Senator Reid and his colleagues put into this effort. 
Now that you have this deal, um, do you want to see the, does the administration and the president want to see the Supreme Court um, weigh in on recess appointments, or are there any considerations of what, asking them to um, dismiss that case? Well, I would uh, refer you to the Department of Justice, but I would say that the question of whether any president should retain the ability that has been enjoyed by presidents for over a century to make recess appointments is one that is still at issue. And our views on this has not changed, have not changed. Uh, it, what the next steps are, you know, I would leave uh, to the Justice Department to describe. But uh, as you noted, that case is under, you know, is before the Supreme Court and our position on it and the right of this president and any president going forward uh, to make recess appointments as predecessors have for more than a century uh, remains very strong. So it sounds like you'd like to see the Supreme Court continue. Well, again, I, the, the answer is yes, but for specific le legal uh, questions, I'd refer you to justice. Yeah, Ruber. Today, Samantha Power testified um, at the Senate, and she said that the U.S. response to Syria's civil war is a disgrace, her word, that um, history will judge harshly. And she said that it's one of the worst cases of mass brutality she's ever seen. And I'm wondering if the White House agrees and what the White House feels the UN should be doing specifically. I, I think she's referring to the United Nations Security Council's yes. failure to uh, pass resolutions uh, that we strongly supported and that uh, were denied or vetoed by uh, Russia and China. And we've made our views uh, and our disappointment over that well known. Uh, it is extremely unfortunate. Uh, and we continue to work with the United Nations, with our Security Council partners, uh, and, and with our allies and partners in the region, and specifically with the Syrian opposition, to move closer to the day when the Syrian people can enjoy a future that is free of the appalling violence that their putative leader has inflicted upon them. So I, the President shares uh, uh, Samantha Power's views on the extreme uh, disappointment uh, that we all felt at the Security Council's failure to move on Syria, to act on Syria. And how concerned is the President in the White House about how history is going to view the United States' response to the crisis in Syria? The President is focused on doing everything we can, working with our partners and allies to assist the Syrian opposition, to isolate the uh, Bashar al-Assad regime, to uh, continue to make the case to Russia and uh, others who uh, are in the extreme minority when it comes to the views uh, that we have about and the world has about Assad, uh, to help bring about the day when the Syrian people can enjoy a future free of the atrocious bloodshed that Assad has, uh, has inflicted and continues to inflict upon the Syrian people. So uh, our focus is on ramping up our aid to the Syrian opposition, working with our allies and partners and the Syrian opposition to uh, strengthen the opposition in its resistance to Assad uh, and to push forward towards a negotiated settlement uh, that leads to the transition away from Assad that is essential for Syria's future. Can you give us any indication of how the ramping up of that aid is going? Has the White House and Congress, have, they, have you worked through the, the issues that were there on that? Again, as I've said uh, in the past, uh, we continue to consult closely with Congress on matters related to our Syria assistance. We are ramping up assistance. Uh, we can't uh, provide details uh, about the timeline or logistics uh, of delivery for every type of assistance, but uh, the provision of assistance continues. Dan. Thank you. Um, what, what kind of pressure is being applied on Russia now to try and block Edward Snowden from getting asylum? We are engaged in conversations with the Russian government, as I said uh, yesterday and have said in the past, about our view that uh, Mr. Snowden uh, should be expelled and returned to the United States where he is, uh, has been charged with serious felonies. Uh, and that is a conversation that's ongoing. The I think everything, you know, what we say to the Russians privately is what we say publicly uh, about this matter and what I've said here all week and, and uh, in, in days previous to this week. And that is that it's 
uh, while we don't have an extradition treaty with Russia, it is our view that there is a substantial legal justification for uh, him to be returned to the United States. Uh, he is not uh, a human rights advocate or dissident. Uh, he's someone who has unquestionably disclosed classified information in an unauthorized manner and who's, uh, you know, has, has uh, in the view of the, uh, of the administration and the government, you know, caused harm to our national security interests through that disclosure. Senator Lindsey Graham uh, suggested that the U.S. should boycott the 2014 Olympics. Um, if Stone does get asylum, if, what's the White House view on that? Well, our view is that we're continuing to work with the Russian government and other nations on this matter, and we hope to see Mr. Snowden return to the United States. So, well, it's a, I'm not going to engage in speculation about that, and, and the Olympics are a long way off. We believe that we have a strong case, and we have uh, made that case to Russia. We share President Putin's views expressed again uh, that we don't want this matter to do harm to our bilateral relations. Uh, we have a very important and broad relationship with Russia uh, that encompasses a great many areas of cooperation as well as some areas of disagreement. But uh, it's a broad and important relationship and we want to continue uh, to see that relationship strengthen and we share President Putin's views that this does not need to and should not uh, do any harm to those relations. Quick question on the economy. Unemployment is still, I think, at 7.6%. Um, there, there's some surveys out there that show that while jobs, some jobs are being created, they're not the kinds of jobs that people can live on. Um, what else <coughs> can the president do over mm -hmm. the remainder of his second term, or what does he plan to do to try and, and boost the sluggish economy? Well, that's an excellent question. And uh, what we have seen as you know, is 40 months, straight months, I believe, 40, Amy, is that correct, uh, of uh, uh, positive private sector job creation. We've seen uh, uh, you know, sustained economic growth. But the President is the first person to say that it is not enough, and we have substantially more work to do. And that is why we need, with Congress, to work uh, towards achieving policies that help the economy uh, to continue to grow and uh, create jobs. And the President has put forward numerous proposals, and he hopes that the Congress will work with him to enact those proposals uh, towards job creation and uh, assisting, for example, on a specific matter. Uh, we've seen some strength in the housing market uh, overall, and that has been uh, positive in our recovery of late. Uh, one uh, item that could do, uh, w would be a great benefit in furthering uh, the expansion of the housing market and furthering its impact on a uh, positive impact on both job creation and economic growth would be to extend the ability to refinance uh, to millions of more Americans. And we need Congress to work with us to do that. So far, Republicans in Congress have resisted that. Uh, but we believe it's uh, the kind of thing that Democrats and Republicans can come together to achieve uh, and produce the positive benefits for the economy and the American people. The same with investments in our infrastructure. You know, the, the, the broader facts here are that we are seeing our deficits decline at the fastest pace since demobilization after World War II. Uh, we see both in our projections and CBO projections a continued deficit reduction. Uh, and while we need to take action to address our long-term, middle and long-term uh, deficit and debt challenges, uh, we also need to focus on what we can do to keep the economy growing by investing in areas uh, like infrastructure and innovation and research and development and education that provide immediate benefits as well as employment and also provide long -term, uh, a long-term foundation for future economic growth. And that's what the President's economic agenda has always been about. And while, I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm a, a, an eager student of uh, Dr. Alan Kruger, you know, and, and I hear his economic briefs, and I can tell you the statistics are pretty remarkable when you look at uh, this recovery uh, and compare it to past recoveries. One, th one, the one thing that's startling to me is that uh, in recent recoveries, including under President George W. Bush and certainly under President Reagan, but also under Pre President Clinton, uh, state and local governments have grown in employment during recoveries. Now, we have seen under this recovery a, a huge shedding of jobs in state and local governments, and a, a disproportionate share of that 
job loss has been in education. Now, you know the President has put forward for a long time proposals uh, to return teachers to the classroom, uh, which would reduce that job loss, would help the bottom line when it came to, un to employment, and would also have the added benefit of improving the education of our children. Republicans have resisted that, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, if we had the same kind of uh, a similar dynamic when it came to state and local uh, public uh, employment that, uh, say, happened under Ronald Reagan, I believe we'd have a full percentage point lower uh, unemployment right now. So, uh, and I can get those uh, statistics, statistics for you. We need Congress to work with us to invest in our economy, uh, to help it to continue to create jobs. Uh, as we continue to bring down our deficit. And again, as I said earlier, we are experiencing the sharpest reduction in our deficits that we've seen since demobilization in World War II. John. Uh, Jay, just to... Uh, Dan, were you done? Sorry. Yeah, that's okay, John. Just to follow up on the, on the Olympics question. <clears throat> An Olympic boycott is not on the table here, is it? I, I, I didn't I suggest did. it was. I mean, I... Well, I'm asking. I mean, isn't that kind of a... I mean, that's not... I think happen. that we are in a situation where we're working with Russia uh, to resolve this matter. And we hope that it will be resolved. And uh, so I think speculation about uh, you know, what might happen if it's not resolved is certainly not helpful, because we're focused on uh, uh, having conversations with the Russian government about our views on this matter and about ways that we uh, can use traditional law enforcement channels to uh, resolve it uh, so that Mr. Snowden is returned here uh, to uh, face the charges that have been brought against him and to enjoy all the rights and benefits accorded to defendants in this country under our legal system. The last time we had an Olympic boycott, the Soviets invaded Russia. Uh, th th this is, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> invaded That would have been, that would have been, actually, but they did. Now, some Russians believe they did, <laughs> yeah, they but did. yeah. Uh, but, but, I mean, they, 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 this is not anywhere of, of that level. I mean, this is, I know you don't oh, want yeah, to I refer you to the senator but, but who, this, who, who, you know, yeah. sort of, uh, threw out that suggestion. I, I, we're focused on uh, trying to resolve this matter in a way that is uh, in the interest of the United States uh, and in the interest of U.S.-Russian relations. Uh, so on health care, what, what can you say, how are uh, the average, how's the average American going to see the impacts of this law goes into effect, um, you know, continues to go into effect over the next year? I mean, what, what would you say? I mean, this situation in New York, you mentioned, I think it's like 17,000 people that are going to be directly affected by that, uh, what, what, what would you say, broadly speaking? Well, no, I think you're, you're misreading the story. I think there are 17,000 who currently buy insurance uh, as individuals in New York. I think the potential is much higher because of the Affordable Care Act and the uh, reduction in rates that that is the competition in the marketplace is bringing about, according to New York State, and because of the subsidies that will be provided for those who cannot afford, uh, afford insurance. I mean, that's the central premise here. And the uh, individual responsibility provision is so elemental to this because it, it is that provision which makes it possible for the marketplaces to work in a way that allows for us to uh, assure Americans uh, by law that if they have a pre-existing condition, uh, they cannot be denied insurance. Now think about how significant that is for families across the country. And recently, uh, when discussing their goal of repealing Obamacare, uh, Republican lawmakers were asked on Capitol Hill, well, what would you do if it were repealed on the matter of pre-existing conditions? And a senator, a Republican senator, conceded that they had no alternative proposal to deal with that. And I think that that speaks volumes about the effort underway here, which is to refight old battles that have been fought. Congress passed the law. The President signed the law. The Supreme Court upheld the law, and yes, we're about the business of implementing the law and, pro and making sure that it provides the, uh, the benefits, the many benefits to the American people that so, they deserve. So, so I'm just asking, I, I don't want to mm -hmm. go through all of all that, just, just, sure. just, a, just a straight out thing, what should, what should Americans be looking for, uh, you know, as, again, a, well, as... One, one of the fundamental premises, one of the fundamental facts about the Affordable Care Act is that for millions of Americans who get their insurance through their employer and are happy with their insurance will see no change. Uh, or certainly no substantial change. They may see a reduction in benefits because of the overall uh, increase in competition. I mean, a reduction rather in costs because of the overall increase in competition. 
What's that? You would like to see I that? I said there went the headline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, no, obviously a reduction in cost, as, we, you know, as, as we've seen in different states as, as these marketplaces have become uh, uh, gotten up and running. What is also the case is that millions of Americans who don't have insurance will have access to insurance for the first time. Uh, and there are uh, provisions within the Affordable Care Act that provide assistance to employers who want to provide insurance to their employees and assistance to individuals uh, who otherwise could not afford insurance, even at uh, reduced competitive rates, uh, to obtain insurance. So the, the net impact will be uh, to see more Americans insured uh, at affordable costs uh, at, with all the benefits that that provides, and, and then to see continued benefits when it comes to an elimination of lifetime caps. Uh, the elimination of the ability of insurance companies to throw you off their insurance or not provide you insurance if you have a pre-existing condition, the ability of young Americans to stay on their parents' insurance policies up to the age of 26. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a constant problem that families have faced, a challenge they have faced when their uh, children come of age. And uh, because they're just starting out uh, in the job market or are still getting education, they don't necessarily have access uh, or easy access to insurance, now they can stay on their parents' policies up through age 26. Uh, the uh, benefits that the President will talk about tomorrow, where uh, refunds are being provided uh, under the so-called medical loss ratio provision uh, to millions of Americans, uh, uh, because the Affordable Care Act ensures that uh, insurance companies are using the premiums that they collect uh, substantially towards the benefits they provide. And if they don't, they have to provide a refund to their uh, consumers. So this will continue. And as we see more and more benefits and more and more Americans getting insurance, uh, the net positive effect on our economy uh, will be significant. And uh, certainly it will increase the peace of mind for millions of Americans across the country. Do you expect public opinion to you know, move We're this? about the business of implementing the law. And well, I'm not going to predict how the public feels about it. I think that uh, those Americans who have never, uh, or at least recently, have not had the opportunity or ability to buy and afford insurance who will have insurance, I'm sure will feel uh, more secure when they have it. Uh, but we'll, we'll let public opinion and politics uh, take care of itself. We'll implement the policy because we know that it's right for the American people. Well, let's go back to the Olympics. I mean, is it safe to say, based You guys on aren't what, jumping to a superficial headline, are you? what you have said so far, can we conclude that the President thinks it would be a bad idea to boycott the Olympics? Bill, come on. You guys are, what it is, you were talking about an event that is a year and a half away, right? Roughly, I, you know, whenever the Olympics are. Is that correct? When are they? Yeah. But yeah. Nice so, a nine right months, okay. Does well, he but think it would be a bad we, idea? We, this is a, a lawmaker put it out there. We're not even, we're not focused on that. We're focused on working with the Russians to bring about uh, the return of Mr. Snowden to the United States. And uh, we agree with President Putin that uh, we do not want this issue to uh, negatively affect uh, our relationship with Russia, uh, which is broad and important. So and where we see... that's a bad idea, right? Uh, yeah, I, but it's, 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 you know... <laughs> It's not one that is an issue right now because we're engaged with uh, the Russians and other governments in uh, helping bring about a positive resolution to this matter. Is the U.S. upset with Cuba for uh, sending missile parts, apparently, to North Korea? What can I tell you about that? I think as you heard from our colleagues at the State Department uh, yesterday, the United States commends the actions that the government of Panama uh, took in this case. And Pan Panama, as you know, has a very important responsibility to ensure that the Panama Canal is utilized for safe and legal commerce and has consistently shown that it takes that responsibility seriously. Panama is a close partner of the United States and we will carefully consider any request uh, for assistance. Uh, efforts to determine exactly what was on the ship that you mentioned are ongoing and it will take time to confirm all of the details. Well, if if it is said that they're sending missile parts to be refurbished. Well, again, I, we're, there, there is an effort on, uh, underway to uh, determine exactly what was on the ship. And if it is determined that materials found on board the vessel violate UN sanctions, sanctions enforcement would be handled through a United Nations process. And uh, 
if that eventuality presents itself, I'd refer you to the State Department and USUN for additional details and information on next steps. You don't want to get involved in criticizing Cuba, it looks like. I think that we don't want to get ahead of a process that's underway to determine what uh, exactly uh, was on the ship. Uh, and then uh, if it's determined that materials found on board that vessel, vessel violate sanctions, then uh, the body that uh, levied the sanctions, the United Nations, uh, would handle enforcement matters. Yeah. Both you and the Attorney General have suggested that the stand your ground laws may contribute to more violence than they pre prevent, call for a debate on that. What do you envision to be uh, the means of that debate, and do you think the uh, stand your ground laws in, uh, should be tested in the Supreme Court? Well, the, the last part I leave to uh, lawyers and experts in the field. The second, uh, uh, the, the, the beginning of the question, I think, answers itself. Uh, the discussion is underway. Uh, I would refer you to the Attorney General's remarks. I would refer you to the, an ongoing discussion underway uh, about a specific state and its laws. But I think that the discussion, uh, in the President's view, ought to be engaged uh, in other states across the country, uh, simply uh, out of good sense, that uh, the laws that we see on the books uh, ought to be reviewed and examined uh, with an eye towards whether or not they uh, reduce the problem of gun violence or inadvertently make it worse. And I'm not passing judgment on any particular law. Uh, I'm simply saying as the, uh, and, and echoing the President's views here that uh, we should certainly examine those laws and uh, examine, examine, examine them with you know, the goal in mind here, which is to reduce gun violence. But not examine them to see whether they pass constitutional muster? Again, I'm not a lawyer. I, I haven't uh, seen that, uh, seen that uh, question asked uh, with regards to the constitutionality, uh, perhaps you could address it to the Department of Justice. I think the issue is, uh, are they effective? Uh, do they have unintended consequences? Uh, and it's the President's views that the, the goal should be here to reduce gun violence so that we have fewer uh, tragic deaths as a result of gun violence. On the Affordable Care Act, you put out a uh, statement of administration policy yesterday on a couple of House uh, bills, one of which would repeal the individual mandate or give the President the authority to do that. The other would uh, give him the authority to repeal the employer mandate. You rejected them as a pair. Do you also reject them individually? In other words, the, the employer mandate, which the Treasury Department has uh, put off for a year, um, would seem to be something that you already accept the ability of the administration to do. Well, we, the, 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 the statement of administration policy on that bill uh, reflects uh, the fact that it's unnecessary. As we've made clear, and the Treasury Department has made clear, the authority to uh, delay the deadline for the implementation of that pr provision is uh, well grounded. And it is, uh, it is being uh, brought into effect uh, in the interest of accommodating uh, the concerns of uh, that relatively small percentage of businesses that would be affected by it. Uh, when it comes to the individual responsibility provision, I mean, that's just repealed by another name. The individual responsibility provision, as I said earlier, is essential uh, to the fulfillment of health care reform in a way that ensures that those with pre-existing conditions cannot be denied insurance. I'll grant you that, but and, on the employer and, and mandate. And I understand, but, but, but Wendell, let's some just. Some Republicans have challenged the Treasury Department's authority and in delaying this for a year. Would you not like have, have Congress's blessing for it? Um, there, is, uh, there are a few things more cynical than House Republicans who have made it their mission in life to uh, repeal the Affordable Care Act and deny the American people the benefits that they would receive from implementation of the Affordable Care Act, uh, claiming that they are concerned about the delay of the implementation of a, uh, a relatively small provision within the Affordable Care Act. You know that. I know that. Everybody in this room knows it. Everybody on the Hill knows it. Most of the American people understand that. And what it comes down to is that this repeated futile effort to repeal the Affordable Care Act exposes Republicans who are engaged in it rightfully to the charge that they would rather see Americans denied insurance, they would rather return to a situation where the insurance companies dictated whether or not you had insurance or got insurance if you had a pre-existing condition, whether or not you could be kicked off insurance if you met, if you exceeded an arbitrary cap, 
uh, than what prevails now under the law of the land, which is the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and as I said earlier, when we saw on Capitol Hill a, uh, a press conference called with the, you know, I'm sure the desire to trumpet the need for repeal, and, and a Republican lawmaker uh, had to admit that they had uh, no suggestion for how to deal with Americans uh, who have pre-existing conditions if uh, their vision of repeal were to come true. And I just wonder what they say to the half of their constituents who have pre-existing conditions about their intent here and who benefits from the potential fulfillment of their goal. So, uh, you know, absolutely the President would veto those bills uh, because uh, if they were ever to become law, it would be bad for the American people. Yes, Chris. Jay, thanks. Uh, the President yesterday met with a number of senators. They discussed uh, student loans. What came out of that meeting specifically, and how close are they to getting a deal based on the estimation? The President believes, as we have long said, uh, that there is no question that there is a compromise available on this issue, that the two sides are uh, not that far apart, and we just need to get it done. And I think that's what the meeting was about. Uh, it was a bipartisan meeting, and the President uh, hopes and expects that a resolution to this matter uh, can be reached. Because, as we've said, you know, we cannot allow a situation where uh, students who depend on these loans see their rates double, and we need to find a resolution that ensures that uh, rates are kept low, uh, and that uh, a resolution that is retroactive so that the doubling of the rates that occurred on July first is reversed. And there's a, there, there is a way to achieve this. There's a way to do it that's deficit neutral. There's a way to do it uh, that does not ask uh, students to bear the burden of further deficit reduction. You know, I noted earlier that, A, we have seen substantial deficit reduction, and there is more to be done on that, but substantial de deficit reduction. Uh, and uh, the comprehensive immigration reform, if Republicans were truly focused on ways to reduce the deficit uh, that are also provide benefits to our overall economy and, and the American middle class, they ought to get about the business of passing immigration reform in the House because, as the CBO said, the Senate bill would significantly reduce the deficit. But staying on student loans, does he expect there to be a deal before the August recess, before they break? He certainly uh, hopes and expects that there will be a resolution to this uh, very soon. And, and just to be clear, does he support the compromise that seems to be coming together that would peg rates to the 10-year Treasury notes with a cap? I, I, I think we're going to let the, the senators involved in this effort to uh, get about the business of finding uh, a resolution here that uh, is uh, acceptable to all sides and to the President. Uh, we think it's achievable. Uh, so I don't, uh, you know, we'll wait to see what is produced uh, before we uh, judge it. Uh, but obviously the President is very concerned about this issue, and that's why he had the meeting. And one on Egypt, Jay. Uh, Secretary of State John Kerry said in an interview today that he's not going to rush to judgment about whether or not there was a military coup. You have said in comments this week that there's no timeline for determining whether or not there was a coup. So what specifically is the administration doing to try to come to a determination? We are continuing to work with the Egyptian transitional government to assist them in what they state is their goal, which is a return to a democratically elected civilian government. Does that help you determine whether or not there was a coup? Uh, it helps us determine what is uh, the right course of action uh, for the best interests of the United States and our national security, as well as uh, the future of Egypt, which uh, is uh, broadly of interest to the United States and uh, our, our national security. And as I've said before, and I've been quite candid about it, we will not act precipitously on this designation because we do not think it would be in our interest to do so. But we have made clear to the transitional authorities in Egypt that the way out of this crisis is through a uh, quick return to a democratically elected civilian government and uh, a government that is representative of all Egyptians, and it is inclusive, that allows for the participation of all parties and individuals, uh, that that is the answer uh, to a better future for Egypt. And, you know, what we, what we saw, it, w w the demands of millions of Egyptians who went to the streets in protest of the Morsi government uh, 
reflected their views that that government uh, was not inclusive, that it was not taking into consideration the views and will of all the Egyptian people and all uh, the parties and groups and individuals within Egypt. And it is uh, evident from that and through Egypt's experience throughout this period that the, it is essential for Egypt's uh, successful democratic tr uh, transition that the government uh, take actions that demonstrate its uh, fealty to the idea of reconciliation and inclusion. Peter. Thank you, Jay. Um, does Russia's handling of uh, the Snowden case have any impact, any bearing at all, on the President's decision to attend the uh, summit with President Putin in Moscow? What I said yesterday is that the President intends to travel to Russia uh, for the G20 summit. And I have no further uh, announcements to make uh, beyond what we've said in the past about the President's travel to Russia in the fall. You can't say um, definitively whether he will indeed go to Moscow as the White House has previously announced? I can say that the President intends to travel to Russia for the G20 summit. I don't have anything to add to what we said in the past about his, 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 that trip. Yes. Jay, uh, back on Egypt, um, does the administration uh, believe that Morsi should be released? We believe that uh, it is essential that uh, the transitional government uh, refrain from making arbitrary arrests and detentions and that uh, those who are being held without charge be released, and that, that includes President Morsi, yes. Um, the Egyptians say that uh, Secretary Burns didn't even bring him up while he was there. Do you know why that would have been? Well, I'm, I, I don't have, I wouldn't speak for the Egyptians, and I don't have a specific readout uh, or that kind of detailed readout uh, on uh, Deputy Secretary Burns's meetings. Uh, he met broadly with uh, Egyptian authorities as well as representatives of parties and groups. Uh, that included a phone call uh, with a representative of the Muslim Brotherhood while he was in Cairo. Uh, and, uh, you know, his message throughout uh, was that, uh, you know, we, we look to the transitional government and the new cabinet that uh, has been formed to govern in an inclusive manner in keeping with the commitments made publicly by those transitional authorities. And it is our view that ensuring representation of all parties, groups, and sectors of society is also a way to address one of the main grievances voiced by, as I said, millions of Egyptians over the past several weeks. And we hope that the interim, interim government will hasten the return of a democratically elected civilian government as soon as possible. And that was the message that Deputy Secretary Burns conveyed in his meetings in Cairo. Who does the U.S. recognize as the leader of Egypt right now? We are engaged with the interim authorities, the transitional authorities, and we are urging them to uh, meet their own promise of returning Egypt to uh, a civilian-led, democratically elected government as soon as possible. You know, what we do as, through our representation in Cairo and in other countries is uh, meet with the governing authorities as well as opposition parties, uh, groups and sectors of society. And, and that practice uh, was true in the previous government and the one before that, and it will be true going forward. Because our interest and support is not for an individual or a, pro uh, or a party or a group. It's for a process that we believe, uh, if fulfilled, will lead uh, Egypt out of this cri crisis, current crisis, and uh, towards a better future. Yes, Mark. Um, I know, putting the Olympics aside, will there be any consequences for Russia if Snowden is not returned? We're focused right now, Mara, on working with the Russians uh, to uh, make clear to them our views about uh, what we think uh, should happen to Mr. Snowden, that she, he ought to be returned here where he faces uh, felony charges. Uh, we are working with them through normal channels and, and having conversations with uh, Russian government officials at all levels about this matter. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to get ahead of that process. We certainly hope that it ends uh, and is resolved in a way that allows for Mr. Snowden to be returned here to the United States. Can you, can you describe the difference of what the administration sees between Snowden and Victor Boot, who was not returned, although the Russians wanted him to return? I can just tell you that our view on uh, Mr. Snowden is clear, and uh, we are working with the Russians to uh, hopefully return him to the United States, where he will be afforded uh, all of the rights and privileges. Uh, of defendants in this country, uh, 
and uh, we believe that there's ample legal justification for his return. Yes, sir. Uh, because of the death threats, can you tell me who, you, since I don't know you, who do you are? Uh, Dave uh, Finger with the Daily Caller. Uh, because of the death threats being received by George Zimmerman and his parents, is the president going to take any action for their security, or are they on their own? Uh, well, I think uh, I would refer you to Florida authorities. Uh, I'm not aware uh, of that story, uh, but uh, you know, the president has called for echoing the statements of Trayvon Martin's family for calm reflection in the wake of the verdict uh, and that continues to be his position he certainly uh, would oppose any violence so of any wrong. kind so they're on their own you can editorialize all you want and I have no doubt that you will uh, but that is a ridiculous <laughs> statement <laughs> Olivia um, Jay a couple on Syria are, uh, are America's Gulf allies being as, as careful in arming the right Syrian rebels as the administration would like them to be yeah, we are working with our allies and partners on this uh, incredibly important matter, and we have made clear our views that it is important to uh, help build up uh, the opposition and uh, especially those elements of the opposition that believe that uh, Syria's future uh, will be best served by a post-Assad government that is reflect, reflects the, wills of, uh, the will of all the Syrian people, uh, a government that uh, reflects the civil liberties of the Syrian people uh, and that uh, rejects terrorism uh, and, and, and that's our, the position we take and it is a position we make clear to all of our uh, partners and allies who are engaged in the effort of assisting the opposition. Why can't you detail um, any part of this military aid package? Is this a classified matter? Well, I certainly don't discuss classified matters. Uh, from the podium, and I would simply say that the President made clear that it's his intention to increase our assistance to the Syrian Military Council, and I'm not going to get into a, you know, a, a, a detailed accounting of the forms of that assistance, well, except to say that it's our view that it ought to be, uh, in accordance with the President's policy, uh, increased because of the uh, brutality inflicted upon the Syrian people and the opposition directly by the Assad regime, uh, in, in, uh, uh, with the assistance, notably, of uh, Hezbollah and uh, Iran. But why not? I mean, you, you keep saying you're not going to. I, I get that. But why aren't you? I mean, shouldn't Americans be allowed to judge this escalation of America's role in a, in a pretty bloody Again, civil you know, war? I, I, I'm just not going to detail uh, or catalog the, the specific forms of assistance, except to say that the president believes we ought to uh, uh, continue to ramp up that assistance. Thank April. You. Jay, um, since the ACA was passed into law, are you finding that more Americans or your stats uh, about more Americans or <coughs> less Americans are finding out more about uh, the ACA because there was a learning curve or a communications curve at the very beginning? You know, we're focused on implementation, April, and I think that there's a lot of, there are a lot of surveys and a lot of, a lot of information out there. I think that most Americans who enjoy the benefits provided by the Affordable Care Act, whether it's a reduction in the cost of prescription drugs uh, for seniors or the ability of families to have their uh, children up to the age of 26 stay on their parents' insurance policies uh, or uh, those who have gotten rebate checks because of the provision within the Affordable Care Act that ensures that insurance companies spend a certain percentage of the premiums they receive from uh, their consumers uh, and if they don't they rebate the they, they rebate the the money to the consumers uh, believe that those benefits are worth uh, are very worthy and helpful to them we believe that as we move forward with implementation more Americans will experience uh, the benefits of the Affordable Care Act, including those millions of Americans will, who will have insurance for the first time because of the access provided to insurance and the affordability of that insurance uh, that the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, gives those Americans. Um, I can follow up on that. As you said, uh, you're focused on implementation, and that was even the case, I guess, at the very beginning. But many Americans just did not understand, particularly people who were in the insurance industry and in the healthcare field, they didn't understand. But are you finding uh, the more time has passed, the more people are understanding beyond implementation what you're saying, the successes and benefits of? Again, I think you're asking sort of a public relations question, and, and, and our focus is on implementation of 
the law and we believe that from the implementation of a good policy that provides benefits to the American people, uh, you know, the uh, awareness of those benefits will increase and the positive impacts uh, will be assessed by uh, both specialists in the field as well as the general interest press as we saw today in the reports about the expected drop in premiums in New York State, uh, reflecting similar accounts that we've seen in states like Colorado and Oregon. Uh, but what you don't hear from opponents who have spent an enormous amount of money and an exceptionally large amount of time attempting to repeal the Affordable Care Act is uh, what the consequences of that would be for average hardworking Americans, for those with pre-existing conditions, for seniors who would see their prescription drug costs uh, jump, for uh, families who's, you know, who have a son or a daughter who's 23 on their insurance policies who would be kicked off those policies as a result of the action advocated by, uh, at least today, House Republicans, but uh, broadly by Republicans. And, you know, we don't think that's good policy, and it's not going to happen. Phil. Okay. Back to the stand your ground laws. When you say uh, the administration wants this examined, what specifically do you want to take place? Do you want state legislatures to consider repealing them, or revising them, or replacing them, or do you, is there something Congress? Again, the the, the, the the suggestion is not specific to any one state or law. It's 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 broader than that, and it's simply that uh, the focus ought to be on a reduction in violence and gun violence in particular. Too many. Americans are losing their lives needlessly to gun violence. And that was a point that we made uh, frequently during uh, the effort to pass common sense measures to reduce gun violence through Congress. Uh, and it's, a, it's an effort that we continue as we implement the executive actions associated with the President's plan to reduce gun violence. Uh, and it's a component of what we're saying now about uh, actions that states could take uh, to look at the laws on their books and evaluate them uh, against the standard, which is, uh, are these laws improving uh, or making worse uh, the situation with regards to gun violence? And, uh, you know, I think that's a, a worthwhile exercise in every state. Uh, so it's not focused on any individual state. Obviously, it, the question comes because of that. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is something that uh, every state, and I'm sure states are uh, engaging in this, but every state could. And you mean state governments? Correct. These are state laws that I'm talking about. Sam, I did promise you one, yeah, and then Ann, and then Ann, and we'll end there. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, the House Oversight uh, Committee is holding another hearing on uh, the IRS's screening of uh, conservative groups. It's been two months, roughly, since the report was released, and a lot has come out since then. Um, some Democrats are questioning whether the report was full. I'm wondering <coughs> what us still believes uh, that the report's findings are intolerable and inexcusable, and if not, uh, how do they view uh, what's happened in the past two months, the revelations around the screening process? Well, I think more information is better, and I think the revelations about uh, uh, the practices have been uh, helpful in providing a fuller understanding uh, of what took place. The President's interest is in ensuring that the uh, tax laws uh, enforced by the IRS are enforced in a nonpartisan way and uh, fairly across the board. And that setting aside partisanship, which I think some of these revelations do, uh, that our laws and the enforcement of them ought to be uh, sensible and effective. Uh, so we believe, the President believes, that uh, Danny Werfel is effectively going about the business of evaluating exactly what happened and what steps need to be taken to ensure that uh, the processes there are improved. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, I take your question and I've seen some very interesting stories uh, uh, that cast some light uh, and I think uh, might cause everyone here to uh, reflect upon uh, how this was viewed in the immediate aftermath uh, of the breaking of the story. Uh, and. You know, the President's interest has been in ensuring that the agencies of government that affect the lives of the American people uh, operate effectively and responsibly. And when there are indications and revelations that 
That is not happening. He has always insisted that action be taken uh, to correct it. Uh, and others uh, try to make this about politics. Others uh, issue conclusions before facts are known. Uh, and that's not helpful to the process. Didn't you issue a conclusion when you called the report's findings intolerable and The report's findings were. Uh, now we're finding out more information. Uh, and what, you know, is important here is that we uh, take remedial steps to ensure that, uh, as Danny Werfel is doing, that the IRS uh, functions effectively on behalf of all the American people. And last Very one. Very short clarification for your answer from, from Peter. When, um, Might have been deliberately vague, so I'm not sure I can <laughs> um, clarify. One, one month ago today that Ben Rhodes briefed saying in advance of the G20 in St. Petersburg there will be a bilateral summit between the U.S. and Russia in Moscow, so we will be going to Moscow before we go to St. Petersburg. Does that stand? I have no further announcements on our travel to Russia. The president intends to go to Russia in September. But you won't say Moscow. Specific. I just have nothing else to say on it. Deliberately vague. That's for you to decide. Thanks, everybody.